Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the third Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 13, 2021, are from Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 23 through 24. That's the thematic Old Testament reading. We are in our semi-continuous Old Testament readings throughout the summer, and we have 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 34 through 16, 13. The Psalm is 92, 1 through 4, and then 12 through 15. We have our second week from chapter 2, or chapter 5, a second Corinthians, 6 through 10, 11 through 13, 14 through 17. Phew, that's a lot of verses. And finally, Mark 4, 26 through 34. So that's a lot of verses to read, a lot of choices for our preachers. Let's uh, drop down in uh, chapter four of Mark. And I think it's important here, we've skipped a lot <laughs> from last week. Uh, we've moved from chapter three and we've skipped uh, a, a significant portion of of chapter four of Mark, but it's important to note that four, one through 34 in Mark is, uh, is Jesus' first extended speech in the gospel of Mark. Jesus has done some stuff, right? Uh, healing the man with the withered hand and the exorcism and the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, calling of the disciples and so on and so forth. But this is the first extended speech that we get from uh, from Jesus and Mark about the nature of the kingdom of God. And so uh, it's first and foremost to put uh, this particular passage in the context of that. And I was reading some commentary by um, Marianne Tolbert on this passage and uh, that this, you know, this, this, that first par parable is unique to Mark. And one of the things that she um, helped me see, uh, especially going into the, the mustard seed, is, is we tend to focus on the mustard seed and then the Ezekiel passage like um, helps us with the like here, you know, here's a small little bit, small little seed that becomes this great bush. Uh, but how much emphasis there's actually on the soil or the ground or the earth. Uh, that the soil has power, um, even the sower doesn't understand, that the earth produces from itself, that the focus is on this transforming power of the earth. Uh, and, uh, and I just found that to be helpful, a uh, different perspective on these parables that I hadn't thought about before. That is really helpful, especially when you think about there's just not a lot of, of human work in either of these parables. I, yeah. Uh, while we read the parable of the sower, which is what takes up most of Mark chapter four, the lectionary skips that in, in year B, but that's a parable that's so full of terror and so much, you know, these are the people where it doesn't work in, and these are the people where that, and you know, it, it, it gives you a sense of, well, where am I in this parable? Am I the one sowing the seed? Am I good soil? Am I rocky soil? And then Jesus says things like, hey, to you, it's been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. And everybody outside doesn't get it. I mean, it's, it's it's so full of mystery and can strike terror in people. But then he follows up with this one about just a seed that grows totally on its own. Mm -hmm. It's like, like, here's the relaxed part, or here is the, well, what he says elsewhere, right? You don't bring a, a lamp into a room and put it under the bed, which is made of probably straw and grass and will you know, light on fire. You put it on a lampstand so it gives light. Like the purpose of this ministry is finally to make something emerge, to make something grow and develop. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. I would be much more terrified by Mark 4 if we didn't have these two parables alongside of the other things that Jesus talks about. Terrified because I would think this is all about how do I fix stuff or how do I engineer the kingdom of God to, to become a reality. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And I, but the, I, I really like the, you know, the, the line uh, that someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise uh, and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. Right. He has no idea. <laughs> and no clue. Yep. Uh, there's great good news in that uh, of this, just this absolute trust in that 
in the, the soil, the ground, the earth, uh, the absolute trust uh, that that's where the power is coming from, not where you're not where you're sowing it. Uh, and it's not your job to be the soil, <laughs> to be the good soil as if you could choose that. Uh, and so I, I just, I, I hear a lot of like, a uh, lot of trust and hope in that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the miracle of faith, um, you know, when I talk to pastors of churches that are successful, thriving churches, and that doesn't necessarily mean in numerical growth, but you know, thriving churches, uh, uh, frankly, the best of them have no idea why. Uh, but what they are is they're fearless, faithful uh, proclaimers of the word, the seed. Uh, not, I mean, I realize you could think about the seed as other things, uh, the work of uh, the work of the spirit. But finally, in the end, they're like, yeah, I don't know why uh, it works. He does not know how. She does not know how. It's uh, there is really good news in that. I think there is. I think it's important too to think about this in historical context too. And I don't remember if we talked about this back when Year B began, but I know I know I have <laughs> three years ago. The um, and, and uh, David Schnauzer Jacobson talks about this a little bit in his commentary on our website. Mark seems to be written to a community that's not sure how it should respond to the crisis of the day and what's the proper response to the destruction of the temple. Is it to take up the revolutionary cause now within the church? Is it to become totally subservient to Roman authority and just try to fit in and try to get along? And I, I've been really helped in this by, by Brian Blunt and Gary Charles's book, Preaching Mark in Two Voices and their, their, their prologue or their introduction that Mark seems to be offering a, th a third way of, of getting along in the world that's, that's deeply self-giving, following Jesus onto the cross, but also is, is kind of deeply trusting the faithfulness of God to work out promises and recognizing the story of God's interaction with the world, having taken a, a dramatic and in some ways subversive turn in Jesus and so how a parable like this sits in a, among a group of believers who are anxious uh, or who are trying to figure out, right, do we take the reins? Do we take up arms? Do we just fit in? I mean, what kind of witness do we bear in a, a landscape of devastation and in some cases, a real loss of hope? And that's just a different way of thinking about how the parable fits and in that case, a kind of, uh, I, I also hear, I don't know if the, I, if the word I'm trying to get at here is patience, but uh, a kind of, um, I don't know, kind of stance of observation or discernment. When you have uh, verse 28 in a gospel that's rather lean uh, and the earth produces of itself, uh, first the stock, then the head, then the full grain in the head. You know, it's not like it just pops out and then it's a full plant or a bush. You know, there's like this, this uh, uh, of, of recognizing uh, of, of what's going to come forth uh, and that there's, there's steps in that and that the fullness of the fullness of the bush when the grain is ripe at once it goes in with the sickle because the harvest has come. There's a, there's a kind of, I don't know, a kind of waiting or patience in that, that I think is also an aspect of, of this parable, I think is important to point out. Should we talk about cedars in, uh, in Ezekiel and Psalm 92? Yes, let's do that. Um, this is a clear connection to the parable of the mustard seed. I guess. Well, the Ezekiel passage sounds a bit like the, the, the parable of mustard seed appears to be refiguring Ezekiel. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, this is a, this is another case of the lectionary taking like the, the little hopeful part of a big judgment passage and skipping the judgment stuff and just having the hopeful passage that uh, this, this is the end of an ex, uh, really an extended judgment of the last king of Judah. Kind of interesting, uh, 
when we think about the semi-continuous uh, Old Testament tract, which is just starting out with kings in Israel. Uh, but then the promise that on the other side of the destruction, God will take this one little end, right? This little tiny piece uh, and we'll replant it. And so it's, it's an incredible parable there of God's faithfulness uh, in the midst of, and only on the other side of the judgment that has been well earned by Israel's kings. Uh, but to me, it's like, I don't know, what do you do when you take only this little hopeful part and skip all the rest? It's, I'm, as an Old Testament teacher, puzzled and a little bit, I don't know, fair climbed. But, and <laughs> well, maybe the link to is, is in verse, what, 24, I guess it is. Uh, I, the Lord, have spoken, I will accomplish it. You know, that's the, maybe that's, I, we don't know how. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe that's a connection. And it's very, very typical Ezekiel. And part of it too is the purpose of these plants, whether it's the cedar of Ezekiel 17 or whether it's the mustard seed of Mark 4, isn't to be impressive in and of itself. It's to provide sanctuary mm -hmm. and a place to live for for creatures right it's to create um it's not a full ecosystem right it's to create a little corner of an ecosystem where life can flourish I said something short you were both so shocked you didn't know what to say like usually yeah. it's gonna go for like three minutes you know but. no i was looking something up really fast uh in psalm 92 anticipating that that's where we were gonna go next so um yeah let's do that know. so anyway uh they cut out my favorite part of Psalm 92, which is a bummer uh, because it's um, my theme verse or one of my theme verses in scripture, which is the dullard cannot know and the stupid cannot understand. So I take that <laughs> as about myself and it becomes my uh, spring point for exegesis. But obviously, like you said, this is, uh, this is a response to the first lesson, uh, the, the thematic first lesson and therefore uh, they're the cedar and the image of the cedar. I, I do think, you know, at this time of year, this uh, when life is teeming in the Northern hemisphere, uh, you can show the very obviously Northern hemisphere bias of the lectionary that this does fit um, with, with um, you know, so the cedar in the two Old Testament lessons and the, and the mustard seed and the seeds, it does kind of fit, the, fit what's going on in the world world and not not an uh, inopportune time for considering these texts. I especially like in Psalm 92, in old age, they still produce fruit, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's something about um, the righteous, this, you know, this, you could connect this to Psalm 1 again, that the, that the elderly are, are these old trees uh, and you look at them and you think, I want to be like that when I get old. I want to be a strong old tree that still produces fruit. And how do you do that? You, you know, you stay connected to God, essentially. Mm -hmm. Rooted in the soil. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. We've got the semi-continuous reading and it's David. We've skipped a few things. <clears throat> <laughs> We've skipped a few things. Saul who was chosen to be king and rejected. And now we've got David. What do you do with that, Rolf? Like we've got a whole monarchy, a whole mar monarchist reign that has uh, been passed over um, to get to David. Well, you got to tell a little of the story, yeah. I think. Um, and this text is all built on seeing and hearing that um, Samuel is sent and he's supposed to listen to God. And there's other, there's, uh, there are verbs for, uh, of sight that are used that aren't translated correctly uh, so that you can see that. I think the place I really found helpful about this was in the, in the first Samuel commentary in the new, uh, new interpreters Bible commentary series, but I have an article, I think many years ago in Word and World on preaching David. Uh, this text in particular though is really helpful so that he is supposed to listen, uh, but he looks first with his eyes. And so he sees the first, you know, this is, this is the, 
the parade. Is it your eldest son? Oh, he looks just like a king should look. Nope, and so on. And then they go through them all and none of them. And so, oh, well, there's the little one. Joke coming, he's out keeping the sheep. Shepherd, always in uh, metaphor for king in the ancient Near East. So what's the one who is actually doing the work of a king is uh, the one that's gonna be king, ha, ha, ha. We don't get the joke, but uh, they would have, you know, they would have seen the irony and the comedy in that. Um, and mm -hmm. finally, um, the one who comes by, yes, this is the one. God, and I do think this is funny, although there is the text undermines itself. I think this is really important, you know, uh, which is that God does not, is not like human beings who look on the outside appearance, but mm -hmm. God is in the one who looks on, looks the, on the inside mm -hmm. that we are built our culture is totally built like that our mm -hmm. politicians and our church leaders always kind of fit the cultural norm mm -hmm. uh, and um, you guys know and I'm sure our readers know that uh, I'm in a wheelchair and you look around and you say where do you see people who are handicapped somebody came up to me after a speech who was a regional director for handicap series and he wanted to talk to me and he said it's just interesting to see you leading this conference because you just don't see people in wheelchairs leading anywhere mm. and i stopped and said really he goes oh absolutely look around and you know there are two there's a u.s senator and one u.s governor who are in a wheelchair and interestingly you'll never see the wheelchair mm -hmm. charles krauthammer for years was a major political commentary never ever did the wheelchair ever get shown on tv mm -hmm. and think back to fdr right. all we do is look on the outside and we choose our leaders by the, uh, this and uh, just to realize that part of the countercultural kingdom of God that God is trying to bring into existence is one that does not do that. And oh, by the way, David was damn good looking. <laughs> Rolf, you two are ruddy and you have beautiful eyes. I... <laughs> That's no, right. I and no your hands. Ruddy, even mean, I have no but... response to that. <laughs> Well, yeah, the text just couldn't resist that, could it? Just no. Like... <laughs> well, some 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 royal scribe had to add that years later. Oh, yeah. by the way, <laughs> for the part about my eyes. Easy. Oh, on the yeah. Eyes. Of course we did. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is clearly for David's descendants. Oh, by the way, your your great 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 grandpa. Woo. Woo. He was he was he, good he, as guy. as as the kids would say, he was fire. <laughs> Uh, so I, but I remember using this as the very first, all right, it's a confirmation, eighth graders, they're starting confirmation. This is the first text I would use mm -hmm. just because it spoke right to them. Here's, here's a group of people that are becoming aware of how absolutely judged they are every minute of the day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and start here is a great place. And, uh, what is a community, you know, and of course this obviously has massive implications for race and gender and all sorts of other cultural norms. All right, second Corinthians, right? Yes. Last week, uh, you know, last week jumping in to second Corinthians four, uh, you know, we do not lose hope um, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of lack of reconciliation. Uh, and then, so this builds on that, uh, although verses are skipped, I think, uh, continuing, and it continues with the confidence. Uh, um, and I think this is important about the theme we had a couple of weeks ago, living in the spirit in Pentecost season, and here walking by faith, not by sight. There is a connection with the semi-continuous Old Testament about sight, you know, that this, a world that, that walks by sight. And so what does it mean to walk by faith and uh, led by the spirit of Christ, the crucified one? Well, then also from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. <laughs> uh, there's that connection as well. But I think, uh, you know, the commentary, just to point people to the commentary, but, um, but the way in which uh, Jenny Pates uh, works out the reality of, of, although God alone can transform us into those who live and love like Christ, we are called to surrender to being made anew. Uh, that, there, that, that holding that tension together of 
of um, of death and life. Um, that 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 uh, death is not in the past. It's it's uh, it's in the present as well, and that's part of what resurrection preaching looks like. Uh, it's this is not a linear reality of moving from the cross to the resurrection. It's um, is what is it? What is that new life? That new life um, also is in, involves a, a kind of surrender or kind of integration of of what what had to be let go and for the sake of this new life. And so I think she holds on to that. Um, I think points out to that tension that was helpful for me to recognize in this passage. That whole expression of human point of view is really interesting. I mean, we can say according to human standards, this idea that because of Christ, we now have to reassess the way we view everybody else in the world is incredibly powerful. And to imagine a new creation, not just being, hey, we all get a second chance, but new creation being all of those rules, all of those standards that so deeply govern how we assess value have got to be now reinterrogated, reformed, or just done away with in light of Christ and to, to dwell with people about what does that look like? <laughs> what does that really look like within uh, your family, within your congregation, within your community? It's a good way to spend a Sunday morning. I, I think, I think one of the things that the, the Pauline metaphor for spiritual growth in the life of the spirit is often death to self to be raised for Christ or raised by Christ, uh, that we that we have this romantic notion of education and of growth in our culture. Uh, years ago, I think this is before you joined the faculty. Matt, Matt and I were in a, a teaching and learning group that we had the the great gift of Stephen Brookfield, who's a scholar of higher education, would join us to think about teaching. And one of the things he taught us was that that in uh, American movies, education is romanticized. And it's this, so you think about, you know, the Dead Poet Society, how freeing and wonderful education is. Uh, and he said, it's not true. Edu uh, gr ed intellectual growth can be really painful. It can be disorienting. It can be hard. And the same is true with spiritual growth, that um, it, it, it can be really painful because it, it, it involves dying to self. And in the same uh, part of uh, Jenny Peetz's commentary that you talked about, she writes, dying is painful, mm -hmm. you know, um, although God alone can transform us, we are called to surrender to be made to do. I mean, that I wouldn't even see, I would even say stronger. Not, we're not called to surrender. Um, the only reality forward is to die to, to yourself, to be raised to Christ. That's how you become a new creation. And it's no fun. Uh, oftentimes, it means the death of a dream. You know, maybe you had this dream, maybe, you, you know, uh, maybe you had this hope for the next chapter in your life, and it is gone. So you go through pain, and then on the other side of it, in the midst of it, the new life. And so there is this, I mean, so if you look across the readings, especially if you think about the gospel, the thematic, the psalm that responds to the thematic, and then this, that you do have this, uh, the promise of growth, but it is, it's a thing that we don't know how it happens and it can be painful, but in that pain, uh, the, the spirit does work new life for us.